this week on The Futurist. There's a concept in the in the book we call the adaptation curve. To simplify it, it's first generation technologies always suck. They're dehumanizing. We don't get the interface right. They're too primitive. Second generation are continuing to be dehumanizing. And with luck and good design, third generation can actually be net humanizing. They can actually be more adaptive. So you think of first generation cities, first generation factories, first generation calculators made us stupid, first generation video games put us in you know, in basements and, and isolated us. You know, now we're close to second generation video games. I mean, we have team speak, the kids can talk to each other, they're building some community skills, but a lot of the things they're doing are not really what we call serious games. I can't have my kid learn, say, uh, you know, equities trading or how to build a city. I mean, there is Sim City. There's a few tools that snap to physical reality, but we can imagine a future that's AI enabled where the games are improving us in all the ways that we care about. Hey, Brett, welcome back. Great to have you back from your travels. Uh, I wanted to tell you that we have a really good show teed up this week because I'm uh, a fellow I've known for a long time, one of the very first forecasters or foresight professionals that I ever met in my entire life is joining us today. We have John Smart. Great. John's a man of many, many virtues. Uh, he is an educator, he's an entrepreneur. He is a, a complex systems researcher who founded the Foresight University, which is a professional services consultancy and training firm for companies to help them develop the ability uh, to forecast and to predict the future and anticipate the future, I suppose. Uh, but he's also the author of a really useful book. The book is called The Introduction to Foresight, and it sets forth not only his methodology, but how he arrived at the methodology and what he's learned from many people going back in time, all the way to Alvin Toffler and uh, the earliest uh, first generation uh, forecasters and scenario planners and so on. So welcome to the show, John. It's great to have you welcome. here. Thanks. Robert, Brett, it's an honor to be here. And thank you for starting this podcast uh, to get people thinking about all the ways we look to the future. Uh, you guys may not know this, but Alvin Toffler, after he wrote his probably the most famous uh, book on the future in the 20th century called Future Shock, 1970. Mm -hmm. Right. Six million copies were sold and you know, introduced the concept of accelerating change to the world and all the psychological issues and the coping issues around that. Well, two years after that, he wrote The Futurists, and it was a collection of folks, just exactly. like folks you had on your pod. And it's a wonderful kind of snapshot of what we call the first foresight spring, which is from the, the 70s till about, uh, sorry, the 60s till about 1980. And that was the first time, that was the first time we really took thinking about the future seriously in this country. And then, uh, then we went into a bit of a winter, and now we're back because of COVID and uh, AI and all the changes. And you guys are really at the cutting edge now of that hey. new Foresight Spring. So thank you for doing that. And Happy to do it. You know, it's thank funny you. you mentioned the 70s. It's uh, it, If you look back at that time, um, it took an environmental crisis and, and a global strategic crisis to get people to take foresight and planning seriously, right? So, you know, like the original Rand Corporation, um, you know, Herbert Weiner kind of thing, um, but also um, uh, the limits to growth, right? The, yes. the, the Club of Rome that put together that very, very durable model about climate, which actually to this day has been remarkably successful in its predictive power. Unfortunately, it's been ignored uh, that, you know, the, there was the second half to that, um, that, that idea of limits to the growth, which is that you have to do something. Yeah. Um, and people read it, the book was successful in the 70s. It really made an impact. It got environmental awareness on the agenda in a pretty big way. Uh, but companies failed to act. So unfortunately, um, sometimes there's a Cassandra syndrome where you can say exactly what's going to happen next, but not everybody will listen to you. So as a professional forecaster, but you prefer the term, you prefer the term foresighter. Foresighter, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Give us the distinction yeah. between a futurist and a foresighter. So a future is just somebody who uh, talks about any aspect of the future to others. And whether you want to be called that or not, someone is going to look at you and say, hey, you're a futurist. Uh, I don't talk about the future. I don't think about the future. <laughs> I don't care about the future. A foresighter is anyone who's paid to look to and analyze any aspect of the future, paid or tasked, uh, far enough ahead or in enough detail in the short term that uncertainty matters. 
So if you're engineering a building and you're applying known models, that's not uh, foresight, that's just engineering. But if you, have, you have to wrangle uncertainty and put that into your strategy, that's foresight. And there's probably, uh, there's probably six orders of magnitude more people who are foresighters, foresight professionals, than our futurists. We need them both. And we love our futurists because you know, they think differently. They're constantly thinking about multifactorial aspects of the future, you know, near and long term. And they're doing it in a group. Right? When, you, when you talk about those time frames, what are the sort of time frames you're typically dealing with? Is it five years out? Is it 20 years out? You could be the equity, equity trading, equity futures trading in the next 10 minutes, and that's one kind of foresight. You could be climate modeling hundreds of years, and that's another kind of foresight. Foresight is vast, but it's always dealing with uncertainty. It's always, as we'll discuss, as Toffler said, it has three fundamental dimensions to it. You've got the possible future, the probable future, and the preferable, what you want. And different people in your futurist community, like the ones that were in Toffler's book, they have a passion for one of those three things or, or two. A few have a passion for all three. Some people want to create the future. Some people want to see what's coming, with it, whether we want it or not, and get, you know, get to the puck first, as Gretzky said. Some people really just want to preference. They want to vision and get a shared vision or get a vision that, I'm going to ram down you, you know, your throat, whether you want it or not, and then just work towards that vision. And so that would be the preferred, the you know, the, the strong aspirational approach. Um, the predictive is called anticipation, the anticipatory future, and the creative is called the innovative future. An innovator, an entrepreneur, an artist, they just want to make things. They want to see what can, you know, what the universe can can uh, allow, right? And so we have these three fundamental. Um, motivations. And as we'll describe, there's values for those three corners. Those are actually three corners of of a, of a pyramid that we discuss in our book. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But so what is strategic foresight? It's anything you do prior to strategy. That's just a beautiful elevator pitch. If you don't do anything before you do strategy, you're just jumping into strategy, doing the standard stuff, the stuff you'd find in, you know, uh, the management books since the 1930s when uh, strategic planning was invented. If you look at trends, if you create scenarios, if you get a prediction market going where people have some skin in the game for predicting what's actually going to happen next, if you survey a landscape to see who's made what bets, who's already committed, right? Who's got their, um, you know, who's got their uh, skin in the game already? If you do forecasting, uh, if you do uh, modeling, any of that, that's all. That's all foresight. And you, do, and you can do a lot of that stuff prior to sitting down and creating a strategy. So, now, now John, your book contains much that's useful for people who are interested in this, who want to get better at forecasting or develop their own ability to do foresight. Yeah. So folks who are listening, if you get the introduction to foresight by John Smart, you can learn these techniques in the book. He sets it out very, very clearly. Uh, it's a nice, concise uh, history of the field and then also the, each of the key insights or learnings or techniques. John, why don't you share with us a little bit of some of those things? You talked about Toffler. You talked a little bit about um, the three Ps, the possible, probable, and preferable. Yeah. But there's another neat overlay that you do in, in your book where you overlay Evo Devo. And many people have heard this term, Evo Devo. Yeah. Sometimes they think about the punk rock band from the exactly. yeah. that, that's Devo. That's exactly you, what I was going to say. Do yeah. you know why? Do you know? Do you know why they they now call it Evo Devo for exactly that reason? Yeah, Evo mm -hmm. Evolution and Devo, even though it's de development, but it's Evo Devo. Yeah, <laughs> no one wants to think about about. Um, Gates of Steel and the hell was great. Yeah, exactly. But for people who are listening, Evo Devo stands for evolutionary processes versus developmental approaches to the future. And it's not one or the other, both occur, but there's a little bit of dynamic tension between them. And so you made a parallel to, you know, the um, developmental is more akin to the probable in your, in your triangle. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas devolution, or sorry, uh, evolution. the e e evolutionary part is more about the possible, right? Yes, that's um, right. Mm -hmm. Talk a little yeah. bit about Evo Devo. Right. So uh, 
I trained under the great systems theorist, uh, James Greer Miller at UCSD. He's one of the founders of the field of systems theory, which is a small field that tries to understand complex adaptive systems. It existed about 30 years, 40 years before the Santa Fe Institute and the modern complexity sciences. So uh, when you look at uh, complex systems, by far the most interesting and, and complex are living systems. And so if you can understand how living systems adapt, you can understand a lot about how to make uh, a good team, how to make a good organization, uh, society. And so, so this question of what is adaptiveness and how do living systems, how are they so good at adapting? Well, it turns out in the 1990s, um, a, a new philosophy of biology, a new set of systems theories of biology called Evo Devo emerged. And what they said is, you know, Darwin talked so much about the tree of life and how evolution loves to create variety. It's that artist possible side, right? Think of the incredible diversity of life. Well, it turns out you have in your body two sets of genes, genes that create that variety, different species. Your children are different from you, in both in genetically and the way they think. Right? And you have another set of genes that actually herd all the chaos that's happening at the molecular scale, and they hit a predictable future order. And those are cat herder genes. And that's actually about 5% of your genes that do that in the development and the associated regulatory systems. They are not evolutionary genes. They don't create variety. They're not, they're not exploring. They're actually protecting you and they're keeping you on a life cycle. So it turns out that there's, there's actually three fundamental ways you can look at living systems. You can talk about their exploratory ability, their evolutionary ability. You can talk about their protection and all the values associated with that. And then you can talk about the networks that they're embedded in. Because I gotta tell you, individuals, groups, they're not immortal. They're constantly being selected out by change. Networks always win. Life as a network has been immortal and has been improving its capacity since the very first cell emerged three and a half billion years ago. How is that possible? Well, it's because networks are adapting. So we think of all the great catastrophes that have happened in history, you know, the fall of Rome and the, the KT meteorite, which wiped out the dinosaurs. Networks are always winning. So in those cases, you know, it's different gene assortments. The actual genetic complexity didn't go down at all and all the major extinctions in the past. It was just reassorted. And you actually find this kind of catalysis where if a stress that doesn't kill you is like you know, Nietzsche said, right? can make you stronger. It's called anti-fragility, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to create teams and organizations that have anti-fragility, stresses that strengthen us, just like when we go to the gym and we, we lift weights or when we read a book and we're tired, but we push our way through. We have these anti-fragile capabilities to the networks in our brains, the networks in our societies, the networks of our technologies. And so there's three fundamental things you should think about when you think about complex systems their exploratory ability, their protective ability, and the way they tend their networks, right? And that's the evo devo or the intersection of this exploration and prediction. Individuals are very big in that they're, they're the exploratory actors in a complex system. Groups, they're the ones that are protecting the system and themselves. Networks, which sit at the intersection between individuals and groups, they're the ones that are always the best adapting. So how we tend to our own networks, professionally and within our organization, our relationships with everyone else, and, you know, starting with our, our, our loved ones, uh, network tending is really the highest value, if you will, of a living system from this systems theory perspective. And of course, networks are general ones that generate the preferences. It's not it's the individuals make them, the communities make them, but it's the network ones that are selected at the top to create the greatest adaptiveness and progress. You look at the history of humanity, it's these fantastic networks we're constantly building using our tools, right? But but humans, let's just compare uh, a human built network to yep. a natural network. So for instance, sure. what crossed my mind when you're speaking just now, about the adaptiveness and resiliency of a naturally evolving network, yeah. what crossed my mind is um, the supply chain, our global supply chain, which sure. is very rigidly defined and it's optimized for efficiency. So it's very yeah. lean yeah. and it's optimized for time to the extent that it can be, it's optimized for time. Yeah. Um, 
But by doing so, they're minimizing other other virtues. One of the yeah. virtues that seems to be minimized is resilience. So when there's a disruption to the supply chain, it creates all kinds of havoc, you know, to the point where now just today as we speak. Well, we, we saw are, that with COVID and hospital beds, right? You know, that's it's, right. It's a classic example, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's one. But then there were 60 ships parked off the coast of Los Angeles for about a year. You know, like, sure. there was a backlog there. They finally got that sorted out. And now the backlog is in the North Sea off the coast of Rotterdam and Hamburg and, and other ports on the North Sea. Yeah. So it, it's it's sort of like this problem that just bubble is moving through the global supply chain. What I'm saying there is basically the the, the human built ones aren't quite as resilient as the organically evolving ones. What do you I, think, I John? Think, I think that's exactly right. And there's a there's a concept in the in the book we call the adaptation curve. And you know, mm -hmm. to, to simplify it, it's um, first generation thing. First generation technologies always suck. They're dehumanizing. We don't get the interface right. They're too primitive. Second generation are continuing to be dehumanizing. And with luck and good design, third generation can actually be net humanizing. They can actually be more adaptive. So you think of first generation cities, first generation factories, first generation calculators made us stupid, first generation video games put us in, you know, in basements and, and isolated us. Now, now we're close to second generation video games. I mean, we have team speak, the kids can talk to each other, they're building some community skills. But a lot of the things they're doing are not really what we call serious games. I can't have my kid learn, say, uh, you know, equities trading or how to build a city. I mean, there is SimCity. There's a few tools that, you know, snap to physical reality. But we can imagine a future that's AI enabled where the games are improving us in all the ways that we care about. And so you're modeling a supply chain. You know, we were talking earlier off show about, about uh, the explosion of, um, of digital twins and how all the big companies and industries are now creating these 3D models. Well, that's a fantastic example of third generation use of those, those tools. When they get sophisticated enough and they have the AI behind them, we can actually set them to advance all the values we care about. I can set, you know, just recently, I mean, finally, Apple has these tools that I can watch my kids use of the iPad. Wonderful. But I want those to be even more fine grained so that I know she's actually you know, improving her exploratory. I'm improving her, her uh, predictive capabilities and I'm improving her understanding of the networks she, she's embedded in. I can actually craft those things if I have the right set of tools, but there's this adaptation curve where things go down. And I think we made a lot of choices made a lot of very specific choices with, with that first wave of IT globalization to push all our stuff to China. Now we've had this uh, COVID, COVID uh, disruption and China going uh, far more uh, surveillance in their values than we are comfortable with. And so now we're looking at kind of this new Cold War perspective. We're saying, well, hey, we got to reshore. We got to strengthen internally. Well, I'm looking back to the 1960s and saying, well, that's great. Let's get that cycle going again and let's let's fix a lot of those things and let's hopefully have a catalytic catastrophe, a catastrophe that strengthens us, right? Because it, it is a catastrophe for some people, or maybe we should use the word disruption, right? It's a fourth yeah. change that some people do not like. But yet in every major disruption, there's always big winners. And if we right. if we use foresight in the correct way and we're and we're seeing them the systems that matter. And you know, yeah. we started with we started with uh Evo Devo thinking because, like I said, there's actually values behind those three things. There's exploratory, protective, and network tending values, right? And yeah. all three of those values matter in life. Right. And so, but John, so, John, listen, the, the folks who are listening right now are going, wait, wait, wait. These three people are talking about all this globe spanning stuff. They're talking about the supply chain and the evolution of the internet. And I can't do anything about that because that stuff already happened. Yeah. So let's bring it back to practical futurism. Bring offer for us, if you would, some some thoughts about practical foresight. What right. are some steps that the person listening today to can do to improve their own skills at foresight? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, one of the things we can do is we can, as you were saying, kind of um, ask ourselves what we're talking and thinking about. How impactful is that to my life? Everything we just said could be valuable if you are in the market. And I recommend everybody here be in the market. Everybody should have some equity. People in, in uh, Australia retire richer than Americans because they are nudged into the market using their superannuation funds, where Americans are, it's a choice, it's a free choice. And many of us don't invest as much as we should, but there's fantastic 
disruptions. You, you mean like investing in the stock market? Yeah, that's right. Everybody, even though, be, though right now it's a, it's like we crashed. The twenty five percent of the value has been erased. Some nine trillion dollars. Now's the time. Now's that's the right. time to invest in the stock that's market right. and crypto. Yeah, right. Reversion to the mean, man. Amen, right. Brett. Like that's amen, Warren Buffett's Brett. number one strategy. Sure. You know? so, yeah. Amen. Hey, John. John I want to. I want to go back to one element of this. Like, you know, you talked a lot about the the historical development of these these networks and, and some of them obviously are, um, you know, biological or natural networks. Some of them are um, human, human-led. Yep. What about information retention and loss, you know, uh, in those networks? Because, um, you know, let, let's just look at things like, the Egyptians' ability to build pyramids, and we we lost that information as to how that was possible. So, um, how how do these networks correlate with human learning and evolution from a retention of information and technique? Yep. Well, I think you're getting to one of the really interesting questions of uh, network tending, which is memory. How do we build? How do we how do we have a memory of the past? You know, there's three fundamental ways we look to the future: the past, or three, three fundamental orientations that we have mentally. Some of us are past oriented, some of us are present and some are future, but we need all three. And memory of the past is critical to being better at uh, understanding the future and at being oriented to the present. This practical foresight that Robert keeps trying to get us back into focused on, right? What are we doing today in the present with this future thinking, right? That That's the key question, right? So there's a book called Guardian of All Things, and this is in my book um, by Michael Malone. And the subtitle is The Epic Story of Human Memory. And it's all about how major advances in human culture and organization happened when we came up with new tools like oral culture, like written language, like books, like recorded media. And now with these computational algorithms, and deep learning machines, AIs can be thought of as actual uh, m- kinds of memory. A trained an AI that's been trained up for a particular pattern recognition is an example of uh, uh, technological memory and adaptation for that thing. And we're just building all of these. You, your, your listeners may have heard of GitHub, the single largest code base on the planet. Uh, it's the Facebook for coders. It's all freely shared. It's probably 65 million pieces of code with about 30 million programmers around the world using it. Uh, that's a massive uh, collective memory, planetary memory, that any kid in, in a dorm room can pull that code down and do something interesting with it. And about 3% of it is this AI, this deep learning code that's actually being gardened. It's not actually being engineered anymore. It's gardened. We're pulling the stuff down. We're uh, tr- we're, we're trying to train it like a, like a parent trains a kid. Oh, I didn't train it very well. Okay, I got to try a different data set. It's amazing that that these natural features, right? These Evo Devo features are coming actually now into our computers. And uh, um, I'm actually writing a Substack on that. I'll put it in the show notes. It's called Natural Alignment. It's a series of eight posts about. What is the future of AI? Is it going to become this biomimicry future? And I, I think it is. But maybe we should get back to this practical foresight, Robert. Um, uh, so one practical thing is this big picture thinking we're talking about, you can use it in how you invest. And it is a, a very, very valuable thing over your lifespan to think that way. And there is some value to this big picture thinking. And of course, in how we vote, right? It's helpful for that too. And how... Uh, you know, uh, how we vote with our dollars, what we spend on and what's uh, create the greatest good as we see it. So, uh, you know, the values, having our values first and trying to keep, have them be adaptive is probably the, the, the fundamental thing to think about and realize your values are your North Star, right? You may be stuck in a culture or in an organization that doesn't have values you share, but you can keep tend to your own values and create your team values to be adaptive, to care about your network. Um, and we didn't say, but what are the most fundamental values for network tending? They're empathy and ethics. And those are the top topics that of you know the last 20 years now, right? The, the, the Gen Z kids are all about fairness. And they're over, I think they over apply it in, in, in some dangerous ways that I know you get to in, in your techno-socialism writing, uh, Brett. Um, but it's a, it's a huge issue. Like, it how is. It is, how yeah. do I model the other? Right. And how do I how do I act in a way that improves the adaptiveness of the network, of the whole? Right. 
and uh, and the self sacrifice so, I might need to do to do it. So, John, let's uh, let's take a quick break, and that'll give us a chance to uh, get some. Um, get, get some face time for our sponsors. And uh, after we come back, what I'd like to talk about is that aspect of adaptability that you spoke of, you know, how, how society at large adapts, how we as individuals can adapt and mm -hmm. how active should we be in terms of response to these, these foresights. So you're listening to the Futurist podcast with myself, Brett King and Rob Tursek. Just before we go to break, uh, we've been uh, talking to John Smart. He's a global futurist, foresight consultant, and entrepreneur, and he's the CEO of Foresight University. We'll be right back after this quick break. Welcome to Breaking Banks, the number one global fintech radio show and podcast. I'm Brett King. And I'm Jason Henricks. Every week since 2013, we explore the personalities, startups, innovators, and industry players driving disruption in financial services. From incumbents to unicorns, and from cutting-edge technology to the people using it to help create a more innovative, inclusive, and healthy financial future. I'm J.P. Nichols, and this is Breaking Banks. Welcome back to The Futurists. I am your host, Brett King, along with Rob Tersek, and we're talking to John Smarter, a foresight consultant and a futurist you said a foresighter john is that is that how you That's prefer right. to call it okay mm -hmm. so. foresight professional or foresighter yeah yeah you have in, you have uh insurers and officers and there's lots of e er words and a foresighter is somebody who's paid or tasked to look to and analyze the future for for others if you have any client any single client if you're a science fiction author writing for an audience if you're if you're doing something for uh, you know um uh, your family, some mm. you're, you're a foresighter in that in that capacity. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the disruption aspect a little bit, and and this sort of talks to the um, you know the adaptability of, of humanity. Uh, but when you look at the most disruptive innovations throughout history, um, you know if we look at the you know the invention of the telephone electricity you know and the telephone that led the telegraph lines and networks and so forth um you know the steam engine the combustion engine now um you know um electric vehicles and, and their implications when you look at the most disruptive innovations um over time do they share certain characteristics so that we that we're then able to identify emerging disruptors in a better way yeah, uh, Stephen Johnson, who wrote Future Perfect and several other great books, uh, you know, the technology historian, uh, technology uh, scholar, uh, he talks about the adjacent possible and, you know, the convergence of multiple trends, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, COVID was a trend that was anticipated and, the, and it converged with all these new capabilities that we had in the, on the software side. And it was pretty clear to some people ray dalio gave uh to his um team um a book on the 1917 spanish flu within the first month of covid and he said i want you to think through how society dealt with this because this is another obvious similar example and so a lot of those lessons were there in history uh the disruptions you know their force changes that some people don't want, but they're opportunities for others. And they do involve this convergence of trends. Uh, we were talking off uh, off pod, Robert and I, about uh, the about his fantastic book, Vaporized, uh, which talked about dematerialization. You're saying, well, I need to write uh, a follow on with regard to the specifics of uh, of how governments and uh, you know other powerful actors can use these tools you know, the, um, the social media, for example, and how, and how they can be weaponized. And, uh, you know, there's an adaptation curve there. You know, when they first come out, things can go really badly with them. Uh, and so we need to anticipate that as well. And, you know, Cambridge Analytica was quite in. We actually did a, did a futures piece called The Future of Facebook. And uh, we anticipated one of our, one of our uh, people at that uh, who, who recorded the videos, they're online. Um, 
he anticipated this the whole weaponization and in, in the Cambridge Analytical the, the face the whole fake news how far how bad it could go if there was nobody at the top whose job was to be a content moderator and if there were no fair and balanced um, yeah. rules which all got dismantled in the eighties right these it's these particular uh, trends you can see that something's going to going to come and then you can do a lot I think. Uh, to respond to that, uh, at the very least, you can let people know that these are problems. And even if you can't change them, you can uh, adapt better to them in your team. So, so why why is it that with all that planning we had around pandemic response and so forth, that in the end of at the end of the day, we you know, um, at, at particularly in the United States, but you could even say China now with a zero COVID policy, hmm. um, why did we adapt so badly to pa- the pandemic, even though we had that foresight and we had that we had plans mapped out in terms of right. how. Exactly. Well, so, you know, we're getting to the some of the most interesting, juicy issues of, of what's called futures in our field. So strategic foresight, we didn't say this at the beginning, but you can get a degree in it. Uh, there's 27 places around the world now where you can get a master's or a PhD. The oldest is the University of Houston, started in 1975. And strategic foresight, like I said, is anything you do prior to strategy. And you can do it at six levels. You can do it for yourself. You can do it for uh, teams, do it for organizations. You can do it with respect to the future of societies, of the planet, and you can do it at what's called the universal or the science and systems level, right? Where's the whole system, the whole universe going? So global would be all the issues that we have to globally agree on, like transnational crime, uh, climate, climate, everything, yeah. Uh, And... Traditionally, our field breaks those six. Those are called the six domains. Traditionally, our field breaks the first three into foresight and the last three into futures, right? And what we really, to be honest with ourselves, in the last three, those systems are so big and so complex, what we're really doing is we're trading stories with each other and trying to make them as well critiqued as possible. So what we've been doing throughout this interview is we've been we started with foresight some of the foresight tools and those three those first three individual you know personal team and organizational they're the they're the um what my what my first book introduction to foresight our first book is about we have a second book coming out called big picture foresight it really should be called big picture futures and it's all about these big picture things that we're having fun talking about now so for our, our, our readers or our listeners should know that, you know, we are going to, when we think about the future, we're going to um, naturally drift back and forth between this foresight space and the tools we use and the future space and the stories we share. And what we're doing right now is we're trading stories. So with that whole uh, preamble, I'm going to give you my story model for why we responded to COVID the way we did. For me, um, polarization and plutocracy are the two big changes, the system changes that uh, w- you know our grandparents didn't have that we have. Now we look at American history, and we had a very strong period of polarization in the Civil War. We recovered from that. We had a very strong period of plutocracy in the Gilded Age in the 1890s, and we recovered from that. We went back to a much more uh, equitable, uh, strong middle class right about the 60s. What's happened since the 60s in my very simple story that I'm sharing here is we've had a growth of both polarization and plutocracy. It's been slow at first, but now it's accelerating. And now we're kind of seeing a peak of it. We're seeing a lot of people writing books about these issues. So I would say when we talk about societal futures and why COVID was so difficult for us and and, uh, uh, not so difficult uh, to respond to in a coordinated way in the non-democratic uh, um, countries, although we will argue whether they, we, that was effective or not, um, is because we are dealing right now with high levels of both of those two issues. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how are we going to get out of those? And I know, Brett, you've talked about universal basic income as one possible thing. Andrew Yang, of course, ran as a platform on that. Uh, UBI. Would. Yeah, he he makes some he makes some pretty good points. You know, uh, Yang yeah. does. Um, you know, one and of would them guess, being that. Do you would you believe it would get us out of 
our high current high levels of polarization and plutocracy. What well, you- not necessarily. You know, it can it could stratify. You know, it like act as a permanent stratification mm-hmm. of, of sort of financial or class economic classes, right? Interesting. The the the, the big yeah. problem you've got is that um, you know as you know we we have seen um, dramatic retooling of uh, the market. So the most um, uh, the 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 largest most profitable uh, companies today in terms of market cap and share price these are companies that already have introduced high levels of automation so if you look at google apple you know facebook um, you know compared to the the biggest companies of the 60s and 70s they employ far less people to yes. produce the same economic return and profits yes. Um, yes. you know than than those blue chip companies in the past now that that's only going to accelerate with with uh, you know the adoption of AI. Here's the yes. problem: is we talk about truck drivers learning to code and things like that. You know, it, it's just the the reality is if you look historically, our ability to actually retrain people like that is is not very good, right? So you're going to need a social safety net. Otherwise, yes. the alternative is you have revolution due to high levels of techno unemployment. I, I don't really yes. see any other outcomes right yes. um the yes. the only thing you can do is that you know you can allow ubi to um create entrepreneurship and create mm. um community based activities and things like that that we can't currently do you know so mm-hmm. um in techno socialism you know one of the the really um, useful points as a talking point on UBI is of all the global studies on UBI, you know, we see that um, people in UBI trials create their own businesses at three, four times the rate of the general population yes. because they have the freedom to, you know. So mm-hmm. that's the one area that, you know, we could really see humanity um, evolve around things that they're really passionate about. And, you know, once you don't have to worry about putting food on the table, it gives you a lot of time and energy to, to, to focus on new things. Well said. I would say they would both evolve and they would develop. They would protect the things they care the most about more and better. And they'd have more freedom, evolutionary freedom to create things that don't exist, that are just beautiful and and uh, wonderful. Uh, I know that uh, Yang's War on Normal People um, has a beautiful book uh, about kind of what you know small towns could be like with everybody had um, that UBI and and the, the economies and the local creativity that they would support. Um, I can see that vision. I think it's. I think I do think it's inevitable. The timing, of course, is the key question, and it'll be different in different cultures, won't it? Because they all have different values. So, America might wait. True, and true. Watch it, wait and watch it happen first. In uh, well, the, uh, this is democracy, you know, right? I, I actually think you know if you look at China and you look at Europe, I, I think they're not going to have an issue with it, and the transition will be um, you know fairly straightforward. I think the US is going to have to go kicking and screaming. It will get to the point of almost a crisis uh, period, or it might actually you know get to to um, some form of uh, um, you know mass yeah. mass class disruption before yeah. it happens. Because yeah. you know, Brett, there's a scenario you- where the scenario where the Europeans can't afford to continue to provide this lavish social safety net already. That's yeah. fraying in some places. Yeah. The other scenario as well that the, the Chinese central government is very concerned about, which is that China fractures from the middle um, as you know the wealth's yeah. not equally divided. Uh, automation is going to hit China hard, as hard or harder than it hits the United States. Sure, so you're going to have sure. a lot of people who you know, were uprooted from uh, where their families were in the central lands and they're out in the periphery on the coastal cities where they don't, they're don't they rootless and they're going to be out of a job. And this is going to unfold in the next 10 or 15 years. It's not too far down the road. So it's not entirely clear that either of those systems is going to be uh, nimble enough or resilient enough to respond in a timely way. One of the things I noticed, John, is, is that we're not great at allocating... Um, resources towards the stuff that matters most to people. If you think about the groups of professionals in the United States who, who get the rewards, you know, from the network activities and automation and technology and AI and all that stuff, um, those folks are almost, I mean, I mean they're all, they're it's sort an of increasingly immoral. smaller group. Yeah, it, That's right. And they're a group that doesn't feel beholden. They have no empathy. 
for the people who are displaced. Then there's people who deal with people who are displaced. I'm talking about teachers, nurses, social workers, the people who good care to the elderly. These are the jobs that pay the least, but in some respects are the most important for quality of life for the most people. And it'd be really interesting to see some kind of um, some kind of mechanism to to redirect the wealth towards the people who provides care to other humans. Yeah. Since it looks like robots are going to be doing a lot of the producing and ultimately they're going to do a lot of the optimizing of distribution of goods uh, throughout the economy. Ultimately, they might do services as well. Yeah, we have a big issue on the timing of those things, too. So that is an uncertainty. Um, mm-hmm. It's quite possible that the difficulty of getting those final issues taken care of, the, the make them safe enough to be used uh, with humans and their ability to handle complex things like uh, uh, logic and common sense reasoning, which we're trying to put into them now, um, could take a lot longer. And also, we might actually slow them down. We might actually... The, the, this is, but John, this is... Mm-hmm. So this is really key, you know, the 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 grassroots education mm-hmm. um, in terms of adaptability m- must be a key. Um, you know, I mm-hmm. use the the story, um, you know, the Socrates and Plato analogy of the stateship in in techno socialism, and mm-hmm. um, you know, this is something that um, you know George Washington, for example, w- was a big fan of, as was uh, Andrew Hamilton, um, in, in terms of the fact that a, a core public education system was needed to properly govern and for people that were adaptable, right? And, um, you know, we've attacked uh, the quality of the education system in the US sort of, um, you know, to get it to the lowest common denominator from a cost perspective. And that that doesn't appear to have been particularly successful because a lot (laughs) of the things you're talking about in terms of that polarization and so forth, a lot of it just comes from, um, you know, like cognitive bias, Dunning-Kruger effect, all of these things that could theoretically be helped with with education, right? Yes, uh, although I do think a lot of it comes from uh, a plutocracy uh, where you get so much concentration at the top that you start dismantling systems that did keep uh, the middle class strong and did create reasonable um uh, fair competition and uh, with what uh, Schumpeter called creative destruction in every in inside of every industry uh, that matters. So I'd like to share an idea with the, to the to the future. So we're still in the future sure. side, and this is from my second book, uh, our second book, a big picture uh, foresight, uh, which comes out next year. So it's not out yet, but um, actually I touch on it in our natural alignment Substack, uh, which will be in the show notes. Uh, you go to Substack, you'll see that. Um, and it's called the personal AI. I, I'm curious how both of you think this will impact. Uh, the nature of our democracy and our planet uh, in uh, over the next 30 years. So I, as a futurist, I'd love to ask a- anyone I can, what are you most worried about? What are you most optimistic about over the next 30 years, you know, for yourself and for your, and for your society and for the planet? And it's a great question because you'll get off so many. Something we do. We do that every time on the show, the same, yeah, right. the same thing. Cause um, you know, yeah. it does really, a futurist tend to be quite optimistic creatures right in terms of you know we're in a hurry to get to the future why because we see see the benefits of 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 these things so entrepreneurs um, as well, well entrepreneurs let, let me yep. yeah so john let me turn that back on you you yep. know what what are you most excited about over the next 30 years well i'm both optimistic and i'm concerned about the way this could be misused and it is ai and it is the specific way that it spreads into society what we have seen over the last 10 years has been nothing short of astounding in terms of how fast AI has improved after decades of not improving. And the way it did it is by copying key aspects of how our own brain works called the neuro-inspired design. That's what a deep neural network is. It's an artificial neural network that has actually copied key aspects of how the brain works. All right, perceptrons. Yep. The reason... And deep, um, deep mind with its AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero were so good because they actually copied some key ways that dopamine works in the human brain to to uh, part, to uh, distribute reward based on predictions that your brain does for what's going to happen next. So it's called the value network. There's a policy network and a value network in all these AI minds, and the the ones that do reinforcement learning they have an actual emotional intuitive model when they look at something as to what's going to be promising and plausible and what is not. 
and they they focus their logic on the things that emotionally seem intuitively gut feeling seem correct so we have ais that are starting to build some deeper bio uh, neuromimicry and i'm arguing that they're going to develop biomimicry as well the, 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 an analog to the way genes unfold neural networks in living systems is going to come into these AIs as well over the next 20, 30 years. But here's the most interesting thing for me. Well, yes, yeah, so the AIs are going to be big. They're going to be disruptive. They're going to become more and more like us. They're going to be kind of some kind of a human machine merger coming right in the long term with the transhumanists, some of the transhumanists talk about. How democratized is that going to be? What is it going to be like when your cell phone has a model of your values and your goals and your intentions. I told you about GitHub and I told you, I didn't tell you that all the best AI tools, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, uh, Baidu, they, the, all the top companies put their best AI tools, their deep learning tools up on GitHub, GitHub for any kid to play with. Why do they do that? Because they know that the, you know, the 50 million coders on GitHub is a development environment. They can't touch a candle to that with, you know, Google's right. 50,000 coders. So the network is already winning in AI and in technology. The networks, I told you, networks always win, right? The network is already the most powerful thing over any individual or any group. So at the top of that- This, period, is, this is, you know, a consistent message we're getting. Um, we had uh, Brad Templeton on a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Brad talked about the Keens and the stewards. Um, and again, that was his same message is, you know, like we've seen it over the last 300 years. You could go back further actually, yes, but, yes. you know, technology always wins. So yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, um, you know, th there's an element of the foresight and fortress futurist stuff where um, we can tend to spend a lot of time debating, like, for example, is AI going to be good or bad? Yeah. But based on that history, we'd be far better off saying, how do we transition AI into society? But we're not yeah. actually very good at that, are we? Right. No, no, but we're, have, we're giving ourselves permission to have these conversations. It's, it's, it's platforms like this. It's conversation spaces like this, where we will get better at developing those aspirational futures. And we didn't talk about a lot of the practical tools. They're in this book, the practical futurism. So maybe we'll do that some we'll do that another another pod. But um, we learn, we see, we do, and we review. That's called the do loop. And that's the fundamental, the fundamental way we look ahead. And so foresight is only one of those steps. First, we have to learn about the present and past. Then we have to look ahead. Then we do, that's called heads down. We get heads down, we're not looking at anything else, we're just getting something done. And then we gotta review. And so that is a fundamental, that do loop is fundamental to how all complex systems adapt. Foresight's just one piece, we have to act. And that's how we get that adaptiveness, right? So we're giving ourselves permission to discuss this whole question, how do we adapt to AI? Well, one thing that has not been discussed much in the conversation space is this question of, those tools, those AI tools, they start expensive and they sit at the top, the powerful actors use them. And eventually they democratize. Like I said, the base tools right, your are personal already AI, AI. Yeah, that, that's yes. gonna change your health cloud, and, for example. Yeah. I would like to ask our listeners to think, what's it gonna be like when you are training a data, an AI that has a model of your values, your what you're gonna do next, and that entire model, you're training it by, by poking and swiping and talking to it and say more of this, less of that. That model is yours. It's sitting behind an encrypted, it's sitting on an encrypted cloud, just like your text and your email. For the very first time in the history of the information revolution, you are going to have a model, a data model and an AI that can nudge you better than the marketers can. From the very beginning, they've been able to tra trade all the best data. And, more, and now we're at the bottom of what I would call an adaptive valley, where there's maximum ability for them to micro-target and nudge and manipulate you, and minimum ability for you to respond to that. You can't ban certain types of ads forever on uh, YouTube or, or Facebook or whatever. When you have that pie, the personal AI, that's what it will do. It will sit as a personal OS. If anyone... I, I recommend everyone here see the movie Her, which is probably the only, it's not great, but it's probably the only good 
an entertaining movie about a personal OS, a personal AI, and what and the interface and how that'll change the way you interact with the world. When you have this thing that you've trained up, it's recommending what you buy, what you watch, what you read, who you connect with. It's smart enough to know the, the six other people uh, that have put public information up on their LinkedIn or whatever that they're interested in starting that same business as you and it'll throw down a possible, you know, profit sharing uh, partner. AI based tribalism. Yes. And you think in the activism that'll come from that yeah. where groups will get together around. And consensus, values? but consensus building also, right? Yes. It, it, yes. Know, we could use it for real time democracy. Yeah. Yes. And so we think about, so what is that doing? Well, it's empowering, it's empowering the network and it's empowering individuals. Yes. And, but it's also empowering the whole network and there will be all kinds of interesting selection that will happen for adaptiveness. There'll be maladaptive uh, ways you can use those or retreat, retreat into filter bubbles even further than we are today. But there'll be people who will skate to the center. As we all know, the best managers, marketers, politicians, strategists, they have to be able to think with people who think differently from them and find that subset of common values that you share, even though you don't share these other values. So everything mm -hmm. goes back to values, right? There are these universal values, those three that I mentioned to you, exploring, predicting, and tending to your network. Those are the three most obvious ones, but there's others. You can explode each of those. And so how do we, how do we talk to each other in a common language of things that we care about? Well, I think we're gonna be doing that with those kinds of tools and they're gonna be educating. Back to your point about education, yeah. That system is called the, uh, you know, my friend uh, who runs the Da Vinci Institute, Thomas Frey, you might want to get him on. He talks about teacherless education, right? What, what, what happens in a world where your personal AI is actually more of a lifelong educator for you of how the world works and protecting your values, right? Then yeah. all the network, then all the physical, uh, you know, groups that you're part of. So, so I think the world's going to continue to get more interesting, complex. Foresight is important. It's your superpower. And at the very least, that's a message everyone can take home is that by having these conversations, we get better. That's pretty that positive. Is, that's a good way to, to finish it off. Thanks. So, John, very John, heroic ending. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, you know, I know we need to wrap this up. So, um, where can people find out about yourself? And, and you mentioned you got a new book coming out. Um, yeah. I assume, um, you know, is that, is it ready, ready for prime time? Where can we find out more information about, um, your books and, and your work as a foresight consultant? Well, thank you. Well, um, foresight university, foresightu.com, uh, foresight and then you.com is, uh, kind of our, is our, uh, on, uh, uh, as our web presence and there's a there's a newsletter there um all things future that you can sign up for and we're going to be running a conference um in the west coast uh in uh, detroit and on the east coast uh, next year and we would love some of you folks to come to that if you're interested at the very least uh, you know see what you think of the newsletter and see what you think of um this idea that foresight is your top superpower and you can you can get better at it just by having these giving yourself permission to have these conversations so foresightu.com uh and of course my book is on uh, on amazon you can uh, you can get it there if you're interested uh, uh in introduction to foresight and uh, uh i guess that's it yeah thank you so great. much well john thank Fantastic. you so very much for joining us those are some great insights uh thanks for the practical suggestions too i'm always keen to hear that that's it for another week of The Futurist. Uh, if you like the show, uh, don't forget to tweet it out or post on your favorite social media. Leave, leave us a five-star review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you listen to our show. This episode was produced by our US-based production team, including producer Elizabeth Severance, audio engineer Kevin Hersham, with sp support from our social media team, including Carlo Navarro and Sylvie Johnson. But the main thing you can do is tune in to the futurist every week we're trying to talk about the future we're trying to explore this but you know we're only going to get to the future um together and on that point we will see you in, in the, the future. future well that's it for the futurists this week if you like the show we sure hope you did please subscribe and share it with the people in your community and don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show and you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast 
for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.